is always something we forget to do. And we are now live also on social media, so we can now launch this event. Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon to who is with us here at the International Environment House uh, in Geneva. And good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening to who is with us on WebEx or is now watching the video of the event, which camera is not focused on who is speaking yet. Um, the Geneva Environment Network uh, has the pleasure to welcome you today for an event co-organized uh, with the, the Sustainable United Nations uh, team. Our session today uh, on the UN system's uh, environmental footprint will present the findings of the, greening, the, the UN, sorry, Greening the Blue report for uh, 2022, released uh, last uh, December. I am Diana Rizzoli, the coordinator of the Geneva Environment uh, Network, a network of more than 100 institutions and secretariats uh, based in Geneva, contributing to make, making this region one of the global hubs for environmental governance. This session will be moderated by Rie Tsutsumi, who is uh, the new coordinator of the Sustain Sustainable United Nations uh, facility. Many attendees today uh, are representing uh, United Nations um, organizations, agencies, uh, and fully engaged in the UN system efforts to reduce uh, its footprint, uh, whose work is being coordinated by our colleagues of the Sustainable United Nations uh, team. Before we give the floor to Rie Tsutsumi, let me remind you that the documents presented, the summary as well as the video of the event will be made available on the webpage of this event. The link is being shared uh, on the chat or is available uh, on the screen. Throughout the event, those who are online uh, can uh, raise their questions by using the Q&A box and we will use uh, the questions to feed the discussions if time allows after the presentation. And with that, Rie, over to you. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you very much for the um, GEN team for prepar preparing and also handling this uh, hybrid event, meaning in person as well as online connection. So today we are very proud and happy to present the Greening the Blue report of 2022 results. And the, we have one hour and it would start with uh, Hussein, who's sitting next to me, to, op to have some opening words, followed by the Greening the Blue report presentation and stories we will hear from three UN organizations. And after that, we will have a discussion or a question and answer session. And all the team experts who contributed and who actually worked on to make these reports are online to take any questions and answers from the floor as well as online. So let me ask Hussein to start. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, friends, colleagues. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, for me to be with you today. I'm also thankful to Geneva Environment Network for hosting this important event. And also thankful to Rie and uh, Isabella, who is online from New York. Uh, they are the roots and the uh, sources of this whole momentum and greening of the blue in the, in the UN system. And they have been working together on this uh, for a long time. So I'm very privileged to be here today also joining you. Um, my name is Hossein Fadai. I'm the head of the EMG Secretariat. You might not know uh, what this uh, body is about. It's a uh, UN uh, coordination group uh, that helps collaboration and uh, um, coordination of the environmental activities of the UN system, um, uh, which has a secretariat in Geneva, and uh, it is hosted by UNEP, and is also chaired by UNEP, executive director, and it has uh, 52 member agencies. Uh, so we do uh, a lot of coordination work around a number of environmental issues, including uh, col collaboration on internal environmental sustainability. And that's the reason why I'm here with you um, to uh, share some of uh, our uh, sort of understanding so far about this uh, area of work in the UN system. So we're very privileged to, to be here with you. I have a few uh, points just to share with you. Um, the technical details of this report will be provided by Ria and the colleagues. I don't want to interfere in, in those aspects, but a few points to share with you as my takeaway from uh, this work since 2007, as a matter of fact, where the Secretary General of the UN 
has uh, really called upon all of us, the UN entities, to make towards a climate neutral UN at a time. And uh, ever since uh, the screening of the Blue Report has been issued with interesting finding, findings and, um, and, and uh, a lot of developments ever since. So this has a root since 2007, as a matter of fact. Um, so a few um, uh, bullets that I uh, felt could sort of uh, give justice to this work uh, ever since uh, are the followings. First thing is that this has been a progressive work. Um, we started really uh, in 2007 from uh, basic works of calculating GHG emissions, helping the you know, UN entities to reduce, and obviously giving some uh, options for offsetting. Uh, but ever since, um, you, know, you know, steps have been taken uh, in order to even go beyond that and then make things uh, and uh, improve in a more systemic way, leading to a systemic approach to internal sustainability, in, in the UN system, and uh, not only covering only um, air pollution related issues, but also improving the scope of the activities. So the scope has increased, the accuracy of the data has increased, the way of um, collecting the information has also improved. So uh, we have really moved towards um, a more systemic approach to sustainability since 2007 until today. Um, so that today we can say the scope has really improved in a way that we cover both uh, specific environmental impact uh, areas such as uh, waste, water, climate, uh, biodiversity, and, uh, and waste itself. Uh, but also we are tackling environmental uh, governance areas in terms of enhancing the human resources and also administration in order to be more compatible uh, with environmental sustainability management issues. So, these progress have been really outstanding and, and uh, noteworthy. Uh, so there has been a progress, uh, progressive trend. It has been a unique exercise as well, because uh, you have heard and you have seen so much of the, uh, you know, theories and science with regards to sustainability in private sector, in public sector even, but uh, undertaking sustainability in, in an intergovernmental system is quite unique. You are dealing with the, uh, 190, uh, two, three ent entities and, and member states uh, and uh, an organization which is governed by all these entities uh, undertaking sustainability measures which would have cost related uh, consequences which might have also uh, certain uh, issues with regards to certain uh, uh, operations of the UN uh, such as procurement and, and so on. Um, bringing these things into an equilibrium and, uh, uh, and undertaking such a, a sort of very difficult and challenged task of the UN in a very sustainable manner um, in an intergovernmental organization is quite a task. So we have, uh, I think, been also um, progressive in, 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 in undertaking sustainability in such uh, a unique uh, entity. The third element is that these works have not been taken uh, in uh, sort of in isolation. Uh, it has had a vision uh, and it has been uh, done under a strategy, an approach. Uh, and the latest vision and, and a strategy has been the one of uh, the 2020 uh, under the uh, uh, strategy on sustainability in the UN system, which has been approved by the chief executive UN headed by Secretary General, which has a vision which is to make the United Nations as a lead entity on sustainability by 2030. And the strategy has two components. The first component covers sustainability in terms of the management facilities, uh, but also it has a second comment which covers sustainability in terms of programming and operations of the UN system, which has a much higher impact when it comes to UN projects on the ground. Uh, and um, it is also more challenging because it has much more wider scope, uh, which includes environmental and also social sustainability. Uh, <clears throat> so we do have a vision and we hope that this work on greening of the blue and the work on uh, operations and, and programming would all uh, lead into achieving that vision. It has been a work uh, uh, with a lot of challenges as well. Um, agencies in the UN system have not been at the same level in terms of uh, absorbing uh, sustainability, integrating sustainability in their work because of their mandate and nature of their, uh, their, their mandate. 
and uh, it has been a lot of work in terms of uh, bringing uh, them together, uh, helping them to understand with each other, helping them to set progressive targets with, uh, for, for themselves, and also learning from each other. Um, it, the issue of resources is not unknown to us. Uh, allocating resources for sustainability in United Nations entities has not been a given thing, so we had to uh, help them to, and please, how many, how many more? One. One minute, so I have to be quicker. So it had, there has been challenges, and I would be very happy to, to, re, to refer to those areas of challenges as well. But there has been also a lot of um, opportunities as we have learned how to work with each other, how to help each other either from a peer to peer or, or uh, in a more collect, collective manner. Um, it has moved from only working at the headquarter and global level to helping also country teams um, and UN operations on the ground, which is also very, very important. So in overall, it has been a very positive story. We have a lot to share with you. I think the, uh, the, the outstanding findings that uh, Ria and the team is, are going to, to present will show by itself uh, what have been the developments so far. And I think we look forward really to a year beyond 2020 to, to, with, with a lot of other uh, visions and also ambitions. Uh, and look forward also to collaboration with not only within the UN system entities, but also uh, external partners. With that, I pass it over. I, I hope that I've respected my five minutes, but I'm happy to also come in and to exchange with you more on, on further details. Over to you. Thank you very much, Hossein. And just to mention, after the meeting ends at five o'clock, there are still coffee and uh, some uh, snacks available, so please uh, stay and uh, talk to us. Um, so thank you for the opening and the setting the scene, Hussein. And may I give a floor to Beth, who is a communication consultant, who will present the result of greening the blue report. Hello, everyone. I am Beth Padfield, or Bethany Padfield, and I am the communications consultant with Sun. And I'm just making sure that my controls are working. I am joining today from Canada, where it is early morning time. Let's see. Take control. All right, there we are. Excellent. So yes, I am here to share some of the UN system wide data highlights from the latest edition of the Greening the Blue report. The report was released in 2022, which is why it has that date there. But just as a reminder, the data that it includes is from 2021. So Hussein already spoke to you a bit about the history of the reports, uh, but just to give a little bit more context quickly here, um, it has been produced every single year since 2009, which had the 2008 data in it. From 2009 to 2015, it was called Moving Towards a Climate Neutral UN. So if you looked that up on our website, you would see it called that previously, but then we switched over to Greening the Blue. And it is produced by Sun under UNEP on behalf of the entire UN system each year. And we do that, of course, in cooperation with the Working Group on Environmental Sustainability in the Area of Management, which is under the EMG. They're also referred to Greening the Blue Community Entities. And then as of the 2020 edition, that is when the report began to use the environmental impact areas and management functions that are identified in the Strategy for Sustainability, specifically the part that is on the Area of Management. Today, once we get to the portion of the Q&A in the room, we also have supporting for your questions, uh, Rie, Lovisa, Osa, and myself. So a few of the highlights that we saw just at the top level is to say the scope for one, it covers 307,000 personnel in 53 reporting entities. And this is across the globe in headquarters, field offices, and operations on the ground. This uh, presentation is discussing the UN system-wide highlights, but we also do have entity-level data, and that is accessible on greeningtheblue.org, where each reporting entity has its own individual page. So we've noticed that across most of the areas, there was a decrease in 2021. We also noted that there were accelerated efforts and improvements on environmental governance and environmental training. We were very pleased to see this as environmental governance, specifically environmental management systems, has a separate targeted deadline from the rest of the strategy. 
the tar target for that is 2025. 46% uh, of entities now have environmental training available for their staff. And compared to 2021, we saw a double increase of the entities that now meet the requirements of an environmental, environmental management system. On greenhouse gas emissions, which is the first environmental impact area that we report upon, uh, we saw some of the highlights here. I won't go into too many details because these are all available online and don't want to waste your time. Uh, but just as a note, we saw about 1.2 million tons of CO2 equivalent was produced UN system wide, which equates to a four ton per capita emissions. Uh, in terms of climate neutrality, 97% of those reported greenhouse gas emissions were offset for 2021. And in, on renewable energy, the system is using about 22%. We broke apart for the first year in the 2021 edition and then did again for 2022, the UN Secretariat. The reason that we've done that is because it composes about two thirds or 64% of the entire UN system carbon footprint. And so we wanted to give a better insight into what was going into that and that significant portion that it accounts for. So the UN Secretariat itself uh, actually has a six ton per capita, and it represents 128,000 personnel and 17 entities. We have a breakdown of those entities and the portion that each one has. Uh, notably, the peacekeeping and special political missions has the largest contribution of that, of which of course is expected given that these are operating 24 seven. And even with different COVID restrictions in place, there was, they could not stop their work. They had to continue to deliver. And so we still see a significant contribution. On waste, we also have separated peacekeeping and special political operations from the total UN system wide. And that is because again, these people are working and living 24 seven uh, while they're on mission. And so when it's all together, we see it's 316 kilograms per person. However, if you take out peacekeeping and special political missions, it drops down to 110 kilos per person. And then we have some information as to the disposal routes of that waste. That one. Oh, we've got some repeat slides. Apologies. Or oh, I'm just pressing the wrong button. I am sorry about that. We're going the right direction now. Uh, for air pollution, we uh, have a distinction between upper and lower atmosphere. In the lower atmosphere, the UN system used approximately 310 million liters of fuel in 2021. And then when we look into the stratosphere or upper atmosphere at the ozone depleting substances, we see the breakdown there. Something that is of course of note is that over half of the UN entities do not know which refrigerants they are using. And so that is an identified area for improvement on gathering data and learning more about our own system so that we can make intentional reductions and improvements in the area. On water, we're still improving our ways of acquiring data on this. It is a real challenge to get reliable data. Um, so we have a sense of what is happening, but real um, improvement needs to be happening here. But what we have, which is probably more informative than just the UN system wide amount, is a detailed table available, which is at the same location as the overall report. And that is on our website, which is greeningtheblue.org slash reports slash greening dash the dash blue dash report dash 2022. On biodiversity, we do not yet have specific data to share, but progress is definitely being made. Um, in 2021, the UN system did ab adopt the UN common approach to biodiversity, which will help us in these areas, both in terms of knowing how to tackle the topic, but also reporting on it. And then in 2023, so this year, we are piloting a process for entity level reporting in four main areas on biodiversity, which are procurement, operations and facilities, staff awareness, meetings and events. 
on environmental governments, and this you might recall I was saying has a different targeted deadline than the rest of the strategy. And this is that each entity at the entity level is to implement an environmental management system by 2025. And here we saw some great improvements in comparison to 2020 to 2021 where more entities are now meeting the requirements, a significant increase in those who are also approaching the requirements. Related to EMS is also finding out if environmental and social safeguards and standards have been implemented in policies, projects, and programs, and there too, we've seen a dramatic increase. On procurement, <clears throat> instead of reading the blue itself, asking different entities to report on this, as the work has already been undertaken by the Sustainable Procurement Network, we make use of their report, which is an annual report called the Annual Statistical Report on UN Procurement. And 39 different UN organizations choose to submit data to that report. There was some great increases and improvements found between 2020 to 2021 20, there. One of the biggest improvements was the inclusion of social considerations, such as gender inclusion and labor standards in procurement processes. They went from 79% in 2020 to 97% in 2021. We've also found that 95% of organizations included environmental considerations in their procurement processes. So this is all very positive direction for the UN system to be moving in. On human resources, which covers environmental training, as it's understood that personnel need to understand what we mean by environmental sustainability before it can be implemented. It's also understood that every single UN personnel has a role to play in the overall UN system efforts towards environmental sustainability, which is why environmental training has been identified as something that needs to be made available for all UN personnel. And we saw the increase here. So now, as I had mentioned on that first slide, 46% of UN entities are now making environmental training available for staff. And just as a reminder, as this is available both to the entire UN system, but also externally for, for use for free, there is a Greening the Blue tutorial that was created in partnership with UNEP and UNDP, and it is an environmental sustainability tra training, and it follows Stick and Bean, which are two UN personnel as they make their way through a typical UN day. It shows what their work-related uh, environmental impacts are and gives way that they can be reduced. It's available in English, French, and Spanish online at greeningtheblue.org slash tutorial. We also do reporting completeness each year. The reason we do this is that there is an identified requirement and commitment for UN system and UN entities to track and report their progress on the environmental impact areas and management functions that are identified in the strategy. So we break that down by impact area and management function to see how they're doing. Uh, we do not get the same level of reporting. This is for very reasonable reasons, uh, just in terms of the resources that are available in each entity. They are not all the same. So we try to encourage through a bit of friendly competition between the entities to improve their reporting across the different areas. So this obviously these slides are made available and there are different locations that you can go for more information on it. And of course, the entire team is here to answer your questions when we get to the Q&A portion. Uh, thank you very much for your time and coming out today. It's very appreciated. Thank you very much, Beth, for the excellent presentation. Um, just to asking the team, have you received any question online? Zella wrote. Okay. Um, maybe just to because this, uh, um, okay. Maybe because this is the um, one hour event, if it is okay, can we move on to the presentation from our UN colleagues on the experience, um, starting from UNESCO, followed by UNOG, 
and then I see you in person here. And then um, I will prepare the answers during this presentation so that uh, we can pack everything at the end of the Q&A session. So may I give the floor to Ms. Miriam Terik from UNESCO in Paris? Floor is yours, and if you can make the presentation within 10 minutes, very much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, Ria, and hello, everybody. I'm just going to take control and uh, to be able to move the slides. Um, yes, I'm so very happy to uh, to see people connected here, and thanks a lot for the opportunity to present. So I uh, am Miriam Tag. I uh, coordinate UNESCO's environmental management system. I'm based um, at the headquarters uh, in Paris here. And so I've been asked, uh, let me just move to slides. Oop. Yes. Um, so I've been asked to present on the subject of environmental governance, which is, as was just presented by Beth, uh, still a fairly new category in the Green Inverbury report in line with the UN sustainability management strategy that then asks all UN entities to set up an environmental management system or EMS. And um, so in the Green Inverbury report that's just represented, UNESCO is among the four entities, the seven percent here that meet the environmental governance criteria. And we were particularly happy about that because in the previous uh, Green the Blue report for 21, we were not even approaching. We were still under does not meet uh, the criteria. Uh, and the criteria, I mean, I've just uh, put a screenshot here of the different criteria to meet these requirements, like have a policy in place, uh, conduct an audit, have training, etc. Um, I won't go into detail, but the question is, so how did uh, how did we do this in in? Well, it looks like as if it was in one year, but of course the process is longer than just one year. How it started um, as. Um, background um so there was um at unesco already for a long time voluntary staff initiatives greening unesco so really dedicated uh personnel that tried to to make changes internally and then there were also initiatives um of uh, individual sections or um or within administration um to include environmental criteria uh but as such there was no overall systematic effort or policy to reduce UNESCO's environmental footprint. Although uh, environmental sustainability is really very closely linked to UNESCO's mandates, and there's a lot of uh, programs actually at UNESCO that directly contribute to, to it. For example, I mean, UNESCO has biosphere reserves, so it can on biodiversity, on climate change, on education for sustainable development, uh, on natural heritage, of course, et cetera. So basically um, it was a question of walking the talk. So in order to really have a systematic approach uh, to environmental uh, governance, uh, there was a momentum given in 2018-2019. On the one hand, with the publication of the UN Sustainability Management Strategy that has been mentioned several times. But I think what also played a role was sort of the uh, Fridays for Futures, the Youth for Climate Strikes, uh, that there was really um, yeah, a willingness also to act ourselves. Um, and then there was also a new Director General at UNESCO. Um, who had the wish to go forward into that direction. And finally, um, she created um, a systemized uh, well, sector for administration and management that brings all administrative and management functions together. So there was also a place where to host sort of such a cross-cutting issue to really um, mainstream environmental sustainability into all management functions. So that was the momentum that was given. And then, oops, sorry, so how did we get from this to this UNESCO CMS mode roadmap? So here, for those who are familiar with the Greening the Blue report, this used to be the so-called traffic light table that shows uh, the completion um, of the different uh, sections of the Greening the Blue report. And here, UNESCO, so that was the 2019 report, uh, had two blanks really on governance um, and on carbon neutrality. And that, I think, was also part of the trigger of our top management saying, how comes that UNESCO has not completed all the fields? We have to do something. And then uh, two, well, three years later, basically, we now have even our own sustainability report uh, with a lot of um, data reporting um, and uh, within our environmental management system. 
So <laughs> from the head to there, there were a lot, a lot, a lot of different uh, steps, formal steps, and then also practical steps. I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, I've highlighted those in blue that are sort of the criteria of the Greening the Blue report um, to meet the environmental government's criteria. And I can outline these. I mean, so so of, it was very important step was to set up an um, intersectoral working group, really, with people from across the organization um, to also get the input from everybody and decide uh, into which direction to go and to set priorities, uh, which then led to setting objectives, of course, but also to have the, the funding. And in Teralia, we've set up a carbon tax on our air travel internally to have funding um, for specific actions. Uh, then the policy, of course, was a big step in, um, in 21 that was approved by our director general. Um, and uh, for the audit, I just want to say, because I know that is um, often an issue for um, for other agencies, there we really officially requested an audit by our internal um, oversight service uh, and that we had to do it basically a year uh, before. So we got a very, very, very comprehensive audit that actually goes beyond uh, a normal EMS compliance check audit. But that was really very helpful um, to further develop our, our EMS. Um, and then also we made the um, Greening the Blue tutorial um, that was just presented mandatory as a staff training end of 21 um, together with some customized UNESCO content. And then end of end of last year, we finally published our report. So that is brief outline and then the questions I'll be happy to say uh, more um, on any of these steps. I also wanted to uh, quickly present just um, our overall um, targets and baselines and I want to say so we go with a 31% reduction target um, by 2030 compared to 2019 level that corresponds to the overall 45% uh, UN wide reduction target compared to 2010 uh, and I um, often get asked how did we do this how would we then commit management to um, agreeing to cut air travel by 35% well, that's basically the key argument was we have already committed to this. UNESCO has approved the UN Sustainability Management Strategy that already says we need to reduce by 45%. And that's the only way to get there. So that was our key argumentation, really, to get um, all the sub-targets then approved um, by our senior, senior management. Um, and uh, then to stay within the 10 minutes, I'll move on to tell, let's say a bit more about what worked well in this process and what maybe was less uh, easy. Um, key requirements and what we did luckily have was the support really of top management. Uh, here on the photo, you see our Assistant Director General for Administration and Management, Nick Jeffries, who's uh, really committed here um, participating in our annual World Cleanup Day event. But also to have, uh, of course, the support of member states, at least of some, um, that that uh, will ask you to um, to move on and go along. Um, then, of course, they have dedicated staff and very clear roles. Um, for us, there it was important that it's really a collaborative effort. That it's not just one team or one person working on it, but that really all the different sectors and sections are, are involved uh, in the working group and in the daily work but also to involve beyond the administrative and management functions, uh, which at UNESCO is really separate, um, the, the programs and, and the key experts actually that we also have internally um, on environmental issues. Uh, very important is of course also to get the motivation up with uh, dedicated communication um, efforts. So we do a lot, a lot, a lot of communication um, and for that work, work really well for us if to have little beyond the formal EMS working group to have little greening groups on specific topics. We have one on carbon offsetting, one on greening meetings, uh, one on communication, uh, one on travel, etc. And that, that um, works, works quite well. And finally, I think it would also help to really get inspiration from others in similar situation in events such like that with other UN agencies or on a one to one basis. Um, we have developed within that time uh, quite a few internal resources and tool. Key is an internal news newsletter that we sent out really to all um, staff every other month. Uh, and a dedicated intranet page where everything comes together and there's loads of information. Uh, we have a staff guide as well um, with practical tips for staff, what they can do, the training, green meeting guidelines. I saw there was a question in the chat on, on that. So we did have developed our own checklist at UNESCO 
um, and uh, yeah, quite a few quite a few other tools and resources. Um, and then, yeah, we really try to do as much staff um, awareness activities and uh, as as possible. With I mentioned the annual World Cleanup Day, but also here at headquarters we have vegetable gardens where we organize workshops. Uh, we did a bike day last year. Um, we have an internal pledge, etc., uh, etc. Et so really trying to get staff on board and hoping that through these measures they are also happy then um, to participate in the in the less popular measures like uh, when we um, abolished the uh, individual office bins, for example, which caused um, quite some uh, issues initially. So what were the key challenges? Uh, of course, always time constraints, uh, constraints in human resources and in budget, that's, um, that's for sure. But also that, of course, programmatic priorities that are um, uh, Give part of our mandate I mean, that are our mandate and given by member states are, are more urgent than sort of changing uh, management function administration. So to some extent, we also had a lack of interest from our governing bodies at a, as a whole. I say we had um, that of some member states, but not as the uh, government bodies as a whole. And I would say from middle management, whereas we had the support from top management, it's a more middle and senior management. Um, it was sometimes more difficult to convince them. Uh, and then the prevailing rules and regulations on on procurement, for example, or travel that um, that are sometimes a um, an obstacle where you first have to change all that uh, before you can actually take action. And um, to finish, so some of the solutions for us, I mean, apart from the from the key requirements that I've mentioned, um, for us, what worked well is really to always refer to our mandate and to existing commitments like the UN strategy and others um, to say that um, that uh, we have actually already committed to this, so we must do it. There's no other way. Uh, also, to have a good mix of well, low hanging fruit, as we like to say, like uh, have the vegetable gardens or here on the photo, uh, we gave out free subscriptions for the um, Parisian by bike rental service. So it's sort of a low hanging fruit where everybody agrees and is happy with. Um, and then uh, at the same time, go for big policy changes that are maybe less um, popular, less easy to go through. Um, and same, yeah, formal steps like the establishment of the EMS, EMS in parallel to concrete, technical and other improvements. Uh, so I have not mentioned that at all, but of course, at the same time, we had a lot of energy reduction measures uh, uh, measures to reduce travel, to improve our meetings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that really goes hand in hand. And then again, communication, communication, communication. Um, I will stop here as uh, this little time, but so happy to reply to questions on any uh, of what was presented. And uh, yeah, again, happy to see colleagues here. And in particular, happy that the next speaker will be uh, Marilu, who is actually um, a former colleague. And so we actually worked uh, a lot together on setting up UNESCO's environmental management system when she was still here, um, chief of facilities at UNESCO headquarters. But thanks again uh, for the opportunity to present here and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Miriam, for the lots of energy efforts and work done within your organization. It was very inspiring. Maybe we can give um, ask uh, um, Marilu and Philip to join and make uh, your present um, your presentation or your stories from uh, UNOC side and for the participants in the room as well as uh, connecting from outside and uh, who includes also um, NGOs and uh, the people beyond our UN organizations, please um, send us the message if you have any questions. And I think uh, as uh, you have seen, uh, we can reply to your questions through the messages. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So my name is Mary Blanco. I'm sorry I have a problem with my voice. And, and, and hi, Miriam. <laughs> I, I have uh, many faces in the screen that I know for years, and it's a pleasure to see you again. And uh, now I'm, I'm speaking for UNOC. I am uh, next to Philippe Perlin, who's been the focal point uh, many, many years of Green in the Blue, very active in this endeavor, like uh, we are in UNOC. And I'm actually, uh, I'm going to be presenting with my colleague, the chief of engineering, uh, Rosario Di Pasquale. And actually, he's going to be a better, he's going to have a much better voice than I do. Sorry, I, I lost my voice this morning. But anyway, 
And at, the, at this time in UNO, we are undertaking the most important investment, uh, the capital investment in our site. All the palace is being renovated. And, and actually, uh, this started 10 years ago, and it's coming to an end in a couple of years. Uh, it doesn't mean that we, we have a, not too much to undertake, because in the picture that you can see in the screen, the building that is behind the, the at the right, the, the two major uh, conference rooms is, is actually right now starting its works. At the ballet, at, uh, we have many phases of, of, um, of delivery this year, and, and, and we are undertaking um, uh, all the steps to make this building uh, uh, suitable for the users and in conformity with the, the local regulations and with the ergonomy of the work. And this, this um, project started with the construction of a building which called Building H, which is a state-of-the-art building, uh, highly efficient and, and very sustainable. And re that it can house up to 1,500 people and is being used right now as, as, as a swing space. Um, I will talk to you um, also as a facility manager, as these big uh, renovation works are being undertaken. Our team is also putting in place a capital investment plan, uh, preservation plan, which is uh, to, to uh, number one, to preserve the premises, number two, to make the best use of space and integrate the new modalities of, of the work space, and number three, energy, energy and sustainability capital master plan. Uh, we will be talking about this with Rosario right now. The fourth objective is the, the garden, because we have a beautiful park with over 40 hectares of, of trees, and, 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 and we are planning to, to take it back after the works to its initial status, which is a beautiful green place. I'll pass the word to Rosario to present uh, where we're at right now with our energy and sustainability process. Thank you. Thank you, Marilu. Um, just, uh, just to go back in history on, on um, our uh, first endeavors in, t in terms of sustainability and energy efficiency. Uh, so the Palais started uh, using um, lake water from Lake Geneva to uh, uh, the energy of lake water to cool the Palais, um, which dates back to 2009. So this uh, this gave us a lot of uh, uh, redu reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, thanks to the the the, the, the non usage of the the chillers that we have here at the Palais in case of of backup, but. At 90% of the time, lake water is used for for uh, for cooling the pal the Palais Conference Center. Uh, that uh, then um, we then, thanks to a donation from from uh, the local uh, um, uh, government, uh, we uh, had PV uh, photovoltaic panels installed on the roofs and the replacement of windows, as well as the installations of the building management system, which enabled us to redu reduce our our. our energy consumption as well as our um, gas emissions by 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 uh, um, by 35 percent this was back in in 2012 2014 when these measures were implemented um, we then continued the, the efficiency improvements uh, thanks to our, our new building management system which enabled us to to fine-tune our, our operations and our, our, our parameters of, on our technical installations and in 2020, we installed a new heat recovery system of our data center, which enabled us to uh, recover or reduce our consumption by 2 million kilowatt hours since 2020. Um, we then recently signed a contract with our municipal water supplier, um, uh, local municipal water supplier, to use the lake water once again, but this time to heat the Palais de Nation. Um, I'll, we signed this in 2021 and are now in the process of implementing um, uh, uh, what we call an energy center project within the SHP. So I'll go to the next slide. Uh, I'll go to the, sorry, our next slide to the next uh, phase, which is the improvements being implemented currently. So we have the heat recovery of the installation of the refrigeration in the cafeteria. This was, will enable us again to recover energy that we produce uh, due to the, the refrigeration installations of the cafeteria. Um, we also have a goal in the SHP, uh, which is the renovation of the Palais de Nation, to reduce our energy costs and, and consumptions by 15%. How? By renovating the installation, by having a new sustainable and, and energy efficient 
new building which will take place uh takes take, take the place of one of the towers that we're going to bring down by improving the um, the technical installations of the renovation of the um, historical part of the palais and all this uh, we're, we're we're aiming to get the energy certification for not only the H building that we have but also for the renovation uh, part of the, uh, the Palais de Nacer. Um, and to come back to the lake water, the heating of the lake water, it's a, it's a replacement of the heat generation uh, that is presently done uh, using fossil fuel uh, through boilers. And we'll have instead um, uh, heat pumps connected to the lake water to, to both produce cooling and heating uh, for the Palais de Nacer. Uh, this is being undertaken uh, in parallel and, and in collaboration with the SHB project uh, with our teams in-house here. Now, uh, to come, of course, uh, that we have um, many more uh, ideas and, 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 and initiatives. Uh, the first being uh, uh, the environmental certification that we're looking to, to uh, uh, be implementing here at UNOD, which is uh, we're looking at dream and use. Um, uh, this is going to take uh, probably the, this year, if not a bit, a bit longer, to, to try to implement everything, which will start, of, of course, with uh, doing audits uh, on, our, on our buildings and our technical installations, uh, which will then uh, give us a, a roadmap to what needs to be done to improve our, our installations and our buildings uh, on the energy and, and sustainability aspects. Uh, second, of course, uh, as you uh, as we said initially, we're having installation given back to us as facility managers uh, from the project team uh, SHP, so Building H and the renovated uh, Palais de Nation. These, uh, of course, in in a design phase, you design parameters, you design a building, you construct it, but then there's all all a phase of optimizations that that are done once you get a new installation. So in the next few years, we'll, we, we, we foresee doing a lot of optimizations on the parameters of the building to make sure that we reduce even more the, 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 the consumptions of the buildings. Um, we then uh, uh, are looking a bit further away in the next uh, couple of years. We're looking at uh, uh, creating a new project because the energy center that, I've, that I mentioned before replacing the boilers with uh, heat pumps connected to the lake water will only uh, allow us to uh, cover 80 percent to 90 percent of our heating the the peak loads uh, uh, unfortunately uh, we're limited with the amount of water that comes from the lake water um, so we're looking at other renewable energy sources such as geothermal or, or photovoltaic or solar panels to to try to give us that extra a nudge to try to go to, to towards a, a full uh, a renewable energy source to heat the palais. Um, so this is a, a, an important endeavor uh, that we're looking at uh, to implement in the vicinities of 2025-2026. Um, uh, together with this, of course, the palais is one, but we have many annexes. Uh, the annexes still have, uh, for some part, uh, most of the parts of the annexes are old villas that we're renovating. Part of the capital investment preservation uh, plan is to renovate them and and bring them up to speed on technical uh, uh, installations as well as uh, as well as insulation, and adapting them to 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 our needs on space. Uh, all this also we would like to expand our network, our district network heating and cooling, which is connected to the lake water to supply these annexes. So this is also another uh, uh, project that we're foreseeing in the next couple of years. Uh, which will greatly uh, reduce our, our, our not only our energy consumption in terms of uh, renovations, but also our, our gas emissions, thanks to the renewable energy at the source of the heating and cooling. Um, so yeah, so that's that's our roadmap for the next years. I don't know if uh, my colleagues have anything to add. Uh, yes, uh, I would like also to add that uh, UNOG know, is, uh, is trying to strengthen uh, the some elements of uh, efforts by increasing the number of human resources so we should we are pleased to inform you that we will have an environmental officer uh coming joining you know in a few months and we also gonna have a, a young professional officer that will be joining uh, the second uh, part of the year also so we will be strengthening uh, our resources in order to be and to meet our target our coming up target
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the team from UNOC and for the presentation on the development, construction, renovation, and management of the building with innovative new technologies. Um, the third speaker from the floor, floor, who is sitting next to me, is from um, ITU, Ms. Robin Zulkir. Thank you, Ria. Um, hi, everyone. I'll also focus my presentation on the governance aspect of the environmental management system, so you'll probably um, see some similarities to UNESCO's presentation. Um, all right, so it just on the first slide, don't worry, you don't have to read what's in the blue bubbles. It's just to show you that environmental sustainability is nothing new in ITU. So there have been several activities in the past before establishing an environmental management system. Um, it, especially, for example, in the headquarter building here, there have been so many renovations for at least two decades, which the black line at the bottom, you can see that our electricity consumption um, steadily decreased um, since 2010. Um, actually, not counting the COVID years, where of course it went down even further, but 2010 to 2019, it was a 25 percent uh, reduction in kilowatt hours. Um, so, th just to show you this, but then in in 2019, when the Chief Executive Board endorsed the UN Sustainability Strategy, we really used this as a as a good kickoff point to say, okay, we want to raise our ambition even more. Um, and just shortly after then, our our management in ITU approved an environmental sustainability statement, which was just basically a one pager saying we, we aim to align with the UN sustainability strategy and do this via the establishment of an environmental management system. So this then really kicked off um, the planning of an EMS, just showing that all these activities that have already been taking place will be now streamlined into an environmental management system. Um, how, what we did from then on is um, we established in 2020 an EMS governance structure under the chairmanship of the Deputy Secretary General, so it's um, it's located high up. Uh, we did an initial environmental review. Then in 2021, we had our first set of EMS targets approved by management. And in 2022, we had our first internal audit um, and and management approved the first full ITU environmental sustainability policy, which built on the statement. Um, and what's maybe important to notice as well, throughout this whole process, we really tried to keep communication open with the member states to really say, okay, these are our plans. Um, we're, we're intending to do this, this as a next step and so on. And I must say, especially, it's not a one-way communication, especially the, with the two targets. I just wanted to show that it's, throughout 2020, um, there were some internal hesitations of approving the greenhouse gas emissions target because air travel is by far our largest source of emissions. Um, so we went to member states to consult and to endorse the plans. And then after that, we were we were ready to, to basically approve targets. Um, and then what's a really good development, we just finished our plenipotentiary conference in the end of last year. And um, at several occasions, there is environmental sustainability, which is mentioned in the strategic plan. Um, for the next four years, and in Resolution 182, for example, it really clearly, member states clearly instruct our Secretary General to continue reducing the footprint and to continue implementing the UN Sustainability Strategy. So I think that's a very good development. Um, uh, on the next slide, I just wanted to show, um, well, I think it's always better for others as well to learn what's maybe not going so well. So the internal audit, uh, which was done last year, really helped us to see where Work, more work is needed. Um, so, so this year we're really reviewing and adjusting some aspects. So, for example, for the targets, we noticed that um, some of them are not that easily m measurable. Um, and just to show you here a few examples, so some of the target years were also a bit too ambitious. So the first two bullet points here are HR-related targets, but I have to say it's quite a quick fix because we're intending to to update our competency framework with environmental sustainability competency. And once this is in, um, from now, like once it is ready, then all recruitment processes can, given that our interviews are competency-based, um, all the new hires can be assessed on environmental sustainability. So that will be very nice. And it's also then good for performance and development measures within. And then the, the third point here that I just wanted to show, which maybe needs to be re-reviewed is, um, well, this target to allow for remote participation is already in place, theoretically. 
Um, but it's we noticed that it's maybe not that meaningful because of course during COVID it was like we we moved online and our our conference technology team they're they're really like brilliant. But since 2010 already, they really did a front runner role. But is it really meaningful to have remote participation? Are the people that are attending remotely just adding on top? Would they have traveled to the conference? Does it actually in the end bring, uh, like have a result on greenhouse gas emissions? So these are questions we're currently asking. Also, it must be mentioned that this was the IT related target. Um, but on the IT asp aspects, there's so many other aspects that should that, that should be included as well. For example, from a sustainable procurement perspective for ICTs, energy efficiency of data centers and so on, and especially us as the UN specialized agencies for information and communication technology, it's really something where we need to walk the talk on what we're doing externally. So um, we, for example, have a workshop coming up on the 14th of February, which is open as well for, for everyone, um, about circular and sustainable public procurement of ICTs. So it's related to, it's addressed to member states mainly, but then of course there's so many learnings that need to be rec replicated internally as well. Um, and then lastly, what I wanted to show here as an example as well. So this is our greenhouse gas target, which looks very nice if you look at it in the beginning, because it's what is in line with the UN sustainability strategy. However, the target is actually this. So there were still some hesitations. So it says by 2030, 45% greenhouse gas emissions reduction compared to 2010, to the extent possible without hindering IT's outreach and assistance efforts to its members. So it really shows that it's a hand in hand effort between us as ITU, we can have the processes in place and so on, but as long as member states want us to meet in person predominantly and so on, we, it will be very difficult for us to meet our reduction target because as mentioned, air travel is really our main source of emissions. Um, however, as, a, as you saw, the slide is called not perfect, but there is progress. So I just wanted to um, to show a few things we've, we've done, which went really well the last few years. Um, on HR, although I mentioned the two targets where the target years were too ambitious, um, there is the target to train all staff on environmental sustainability. So this training that Beth has mentioned in the, in the beginning is now mandatory for all staff. Also, quite early on, when we adopted the EMS, HR was really good in translating the HR-related aspects into an own sustainability strategy for them to see how they can um, include it into their processes. And this was really helpful because we just had a few staff changes internally in, in HR and like the, man, the managers of the respective teams, they, well, especially one person left. And it was really easy for me to then just share the strategy with the new person saying this was approved by the head of HR in the past. So please keep this on your agenda. So that made it very, very good for the environment team. Um, and then in terms of making meetings paperless and, and include environmental sustainability considerations, there has been quite a lot happening as well. We have now established paperless guidelines, uh, greening IT events guidelines, several events like our PP conference has um, have included greening aspects. And also on the facilities front, for example, these are just examples that we've started to see um, to phase out single use plastic. So even delegates are invited to bring their own bottle, for example, because they will not find any plastic caps anymore. Um, and we have also eliminated single use uh, bins and have now recycling stations, for example, as Miriam had mentioned as well for UNESCO. Um, we also have a he new headquarter building. I won't go into detail because many aspects are similar to what UNOC has mentioned. I just quickly wanted to show it because there is, uh, well, it's such a huge project. So I, I felt it was weird to not mention it. Um, but well, in the end, thank you very much to Greening the Blue as well. The whole like the whole team was really supportive in pushing our efforts forward and also just exchanging with other with other agencies is really, really valuable. Well, and thanks for you too for listening in. And there's many, many other things to talk to. Sorry, I can talk very fast. So if you want to have any details, let me know. Thank you very much, Robin, for another really inspirational experience and your um the the experience and sharing of what you have been doing. With permission from Geneva Environment Network, we can now extend the session for just 10 minutes. So before going to you, Jean-Pierre, Jean I would like to take um, questions from the floor. If you have any, we can have five minutes. Just to mention that there were questions online, but your colleagues uh, have been very efficient online in replying to who has. Uh, so I don't know if Aza or one of the colleagues who has been replying to the questions online might want to, to just summarize what the questions were.
Thank you. And I just saw the questions in the chat, so I haven't had access to the Q&A, unfortunately, but the questions in the chat were on the green events, if we have any support and guidance on uh, sustainable events, and we do. We have an online tool that UNEP uh, via the Sun facility and UNEP to proceed developed together with a consultancy firm named Gord. It's available online and open source green events tool dot com. And we also have uh, guidance material on virtual and hybrid meetings uh, to reduce air travel to meetings and also uh, other material related to travel that are, is being updated. So there is uh, a lot of material available to be shared on this. So just feel free to contact us after the meeting if you want uh, to access this material. The question, I heard there was a question uh, on the lake. I haven't responded to it. And maybe someone can read that question if it's still out there unresponded or if Beth has any further comments, over. Thank you, sir. The question is about the lake, is about the lake water temperature, Diana. Uh, sorry, it's about the lake water use for cooling systems. Um, that somebody, so Kat, Katinka Koke, who's online with us, is asking that she's mentioning that she heard that the water sent back to the lake uh, to a slightly increase in the lake temperature. So this is more on the environmental impact of the, uh, maybe uh, Jean-Pierre is somebody who might have an answer to that question. Yes. Yes. Uh, with pleasure. First of all, good afternoon to or good morning to to everyone. Uh, concerning the the lake, um, the volume of the lake uh, is uh, absolutely huge compared to to what is sent back. So for the time being, uh, it's a rather limited uh, experiment uh, called uh, GLN. It's what is uh, working now uh, for the UN and other entities. Now the next phase that has been mentioned, it will be also for heating. So the, the volume of water will increase, but uh, compared to the volume of the lake uh, overall, it's um, less than uh, 111000 percent. So it's extremely limited. But uh, to tell you the truth, the University of Geneva is still looking uh, on the matter to see if we increase, because I mean, now we have started with Geneva. Lausanne is doing the same. Um, maybe one day you have Avion, or no? I mean, everyone around the lake will use the same process. So, of course, <laughs> the amount of water will increase. So, there is a possible concern on, on this. Uh, the water that is released back is around uh, 20 degrees, and the one that is pumped is around 7 uh, degrees. So, there is a quite, quite a difference. So, as far as it is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, extremely limited, it's fine. If we take uh, somehow half of the lake, of course, it will be quite different. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Are there any other questions from the floor or the people linked online as well? Yes, Isabella, please. Not really. Can you try again, Isabella? Can you speak? Mm, it's difficult. Yeah, okay. I got it. <laughs> so you will write. <laughs> I see it in the chat, the question from Isabella, if it's on the sustainability strategy and the support for member states in, in the implementation. And uh, I think it's a very relevant question uh, that uh, member states, are, we, are they supporting the implementation, asking for efforts from the UN system uh, to implement this strategy uh, as a, also a driver for change within the UN system? Or how much uh, does these coordination efforts uh, that are going on help member states also in their internal environmental sustainability efforts. Over. I hope it got it right, Isabella. And also, is this a question to whom? I'm guessing the permanent missions uh, member states present, if yes. it's something they I have excellent. considered. Yes. 
May I be yes, asked, can, can we look at the corner of the country delegates? Of Thank you. Member states online and some, some member states online and some here in the room. So, of course, we are looking at you with the. Sorry, I couldn't really understand the question. Maybe if you can repeat it and. If the UN sustainability strategy, first of all, if you have heard about it before and followed up efforts from UN entities on this in your collaborations and partnerships with UN entities. No, sorry, I'm not able to respond. No, I, no sorry. I can just relate to the presentations from both UNESCO and ITU who highlighted that when they have been hesitant in setting targets from their management uh, perspective, they have turned to member states for support. And also when UNESCO has implemented their environmental management system, there was support from member states to do this. So if there has been any other interaction with US member states on the sustainability strategy or internal uh, sustainability efforts, uh, in, in terms of uh, bilateral meetings or so uh, discussing these items. I also find that's a very important and good point when also hearing, listening to your presentation about setting a target and how the target of the emission which would directly affect our operation mode and so, yes, indeed, um, that's the some topic maybe we could discuss further or some so find the way to collaborate further. And I can see some nodding heads in this room just to report you. <laughs> if there are there any other questions? I think we can talk maybe like one hour to discuss more details about your experience and other issues, but maybe as we are now um, eight minutes past five o'clock, maybe we can give floor to John Pierre, um, Executive Director of 2050 today, to have some um, more viewpoint from outside of the UN and our collaboration. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rie. First of all, it's a great uh, pleasure to be uh, with all of you uh, here uh, discussing about uh, what we are doing. So if you allow me, I will extend a bit the perspective to show um, basically where we stand all over on, on this planet, because uh, it's uh, wonderful to hear you, to have uh, these strategies and so on, but we have uh, also some realities that sometimes it's good to, to repeat, even if we know them. So I will just show you a few, few slides to, to show where we stand. So we are all aware of the impact of uh, climate change, but sometimes we forget uh, the figures. And uh, if we, you would like to remember one figure, I think this one is quite telling. Every single second, and I underline single second, 10 swimming pools of ice are melting. So, I mean, it's absolutely impressive. You know, uh, it's uh, all over the world. It's uh, the glacier, it's the Antarctic, it's the Arctic. But if you think, I have spoken already for more than 30 seconds, so it's uh, already 300 swimming pools. And uh, for the ones that are familiar with the uh, Geneva landscape, you know, there is a rather big exhibition center here called uh, Palexpo. So after 60 seconds, one minute, this volume of ice has just disappeared. So it's just to show how far and how fast it's going. And so when we have all these beautiful strategies, uh, 2030, 2050, we have always to keep in mind that the uh, time in front of us is extremely short. Second uh, element is about uh, what is left in terms of carbon budget? Okay, we have again beautiful strategies to reduce by 45%, as we have heard, and it's not even sure by 2030. But in fact, the time in front of us not to reach 1.5 degree is almost tomorrow. By according to what we emit nowadays, in six years and a half, the budget will just be over. 
So as we are all human beings on the same planet, if we divide it uh, one by one, 8 billion people, just uh, we have reached uh, this uh, threshold, it means that till we exhaust this budget is just 34 tons per year. So, uh, I mean, overall, sorry. So if we uh, say it by year, it's five tons per individual, per capita, per year. Later on, we will see, uh, you have heard already uh, where we stand uh, uh, here within the UN system, but overall, and you will see the, the figures are, are quite staggering. So here is to know that these 5.2 tons means that by 2030, it's over. I mean, there is nothing else to emit. So it's just impossible because it will continue to, to live. So, I mean, we have to, to admit that all the strategies we have uh, devised and we think should be in place according to what we emit now will just not work. So uh, 2050 will be just another world, very much beyond 1.5 or 2 or even worse. So now let's have some good news. If we go to, to the next one, uh, yes, here, we see that uh, 22 was a good year for uh, two aspects. First one, because we are here in Europe, it was the first time in history that the level of uh, renewable energy has reached its peak compared to all other energy. So you see the, the red line that it's a renewable 100% uh, from uh, wind and solar is at the highest level of energy production within Europe. And the other ones are going down. Unfortunately, coal went slightly up, but basically the trend is going to the direction. What we see also, it's going pretty slowly. It's only the last 20 years that we made a real effort. So you see, the trend is good, but we have to go up much, much, much faster. Second good news is that for the first time also in 22 in history, the level of investment in renewable energy was the same level of fossil fuels. So we'll say, okay, it's quite a disaster because it's more than 103,000 billions invested in fossil fuels. But at least it's a good news that uh, renewable were at the same level. So we see the trend is good, but is by far, far too slow. And now we will have the reality check with uh, the last uh, slide. Is it coming? The last slide is to see where, no, it's going too fast, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, the reality check is where we stand. So first of all, let's start uh, concretely because 2050 today is about international Geneva. It's not the whole world is here to improve the sustainability of, of this sector. Why so? Because we are, I'm representative of the Swiss government and we are supported by uh, local authorities and energy provider and university uh, of Geneva. So we try really to, to make and help everyone to make a difference here. So if we take uh, in, uh, Geneva, we see that currently we are at 14 tons of CO2 emission per capita. So we remember that just before I said to you that what is left to go to zero is 5.2. So it means we have to divide just by three in six years. So, I mean, we are not at all on, on this uh, direction. Now, if we take the world, not uh, much better because it's half of uh, what we do, is around six tons. So every single human being on this planet, on average, emits six tons. So we see here as well that the effort is absolutely huge. Now, the good news is uh, if we take uh, the last three years that we have measured here for 2050 today or for the UN system, I took the references of greening the blue, we see that in the last three years, 29, 20, 20, and 21, we have been able to decrease almost by 50% emission globally. I mean, for what we have measured. So this is good news because it means that we can do something very fast. It just, we have to decide to do it and it's not going to happen just by coincidence. Now, if we take what have uh, diminished, it's quite obvious, it was mentioned, 
it's of course air travel. But we have seen, and this is positive news, that over the last three years, it was maybe not the perfect system to live in the world, but we were still alive, we were still working, we will still emit to produce and to meet. So it was not uh, completely over. So if we look on, on the right hand side, the figures, you see that we have really drastically reduced emission uh, on aviation and it had a huge impact overall on our impact. So the conclusion is that we can do something. I mean, it's not a lack of uh, options, a lack of solutions, a lack of uh, any uh, technical element. What is lacking is the willingness to do it. I mean, the willingness to go and to be extremely, extremely fast. So my conclusion is that we have all the tools, we have all the, the system, all the parameters to succeed. Now we have to speed up by far. So by 2030, we can really make a difference and use this budget till 2050 and not till 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to close the session, thanking to all the speakers today as well as the SAN team who have been um, joining online, Osa, um, Lovisa, as well as Isabel, thank you for your excellent question. So now we would like to close this session. There are still coffee and some fruits available outside, and if you have time, and if you have time to speak with us, to have a little bit more further, um, exchange of all our experience and opinions, that would be great. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks a lot. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.